Uh, it's uh, my real pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight because of the topic, which is one of great uh, affection to me, but that in addition to, of course, the person. Uh, Cecilia Koch is a, is a wonderful friend for some of us who know her and a great advocate, a passionate advocate of human liberty and uh, so um, uh, eminently suitable person to talk on the topic. Uh, I thought I could tell you a little bit about her bio, but instead I thought I'd ask her if I could have something uh, less boring than a regular bio uh, and ask her if she's ever done anything stupid or amusing or embarrassing <laughs> that I could tease her on. And she said, yes, she has, and it's very stupid and very embarrassing, and that is that she's agreed to give this talk at the Free Market <laughs> Foundation tonight. <laughs> And uh, so it's not just stupid and embarrassing, but she says intimidating because of the topic rather than the audience. Uh, but looking around the audience, I see there may also be some reason to be intimidated by the topic and the audience. Uh, Cecilia is, um, uh, has, a, has a background I'll get to in a moment, but one of the things she is is a formidable singer. For those who don't know, she loves music. She's a music lover and a dancer, and what she thought of doing with her life was running a dance studio, a formidable ballet dancer too, and uh, she's doing now instead Fighting for Freedom, which is a, a more worthy pursuit, I believe, uh, but maybe something that uh, she is, uh, doesn't always enjoy as much, but I hope she is, at least feels fulfilled. Before getting on to Cecilia and the topic, uh, I'm going to mention that three days ago my colleague Temba Nolachungu uh, said to me apropos the topic of your presentation this evening, he said, I really feel sorry for white men. And uh, he has himself a radical background, was coordinator of the armed struggle in the Western Cape and uh, Marxist-Leninist revolutionary, uh, now a classical liberal. And he said, it must be that you always have to walk on eggshells nowadays. You have to be constantly careful about what you say and how you say it and uh, it becomes more and more difficult and he feels more and more sympathy for the uh, care with which white men must now express themselves. And that was in sharp contrast with his and my radical leftist backgrounds at university in the 60s and 70s. Well, he was briefly because he was expelled from Fort Hare because of his uh, student uh, radicalism. Uh, but in those days, uh, the left and what attracted me to the left and him was that it was characterized by freedom of expression, freedom of bodily integrity, freedom of lifestyle choices. Uh, the whole idea of personal civil liberties and freedom was what characterized it and how paradoxical and <coughs> ironic that it seems now to be quite the opposite. Uh, the left, still called the left, is now precisely against all of the things the left was for and characterized by then. And uh, Cecilia will be addressing us on that to some extent. It goes even further. Some of you know that I am an uh, opponent of uh, what are called tobacco controls, uh, but there are no such things as tobacco controls. You have never seen an official running around trying to control an unruly piece of tobacco. Uh, all <laughs> controls are people controls. There is no such thing as maize control or agricultural control or transport. Controls are people controls. All controls control people. And uh, the control over one's own body uh, is now under continuous assault and, and reaching completely ridiculous proportions. Control over, control over your mouth. Uh, I'm in favor of privatizing everybody's mouth. I think everybody should have control over what goes into their mouth and what goes out of their mouth. And uh, that, of course, anyone who understands uh, classical liberalism 101 will know that it means you can't inflict anything on me. In other words, you're allowed to wave your fist around in the air, but not where my nose is. <laughs> You're allowed to blow smoke out of your mouth or suck it into your mouth, but not where my nose is. The same principle applies. Very, very simple, quite straightforward, and was well understood once. And the people who wanted to regulate what we said and did and lived and how we lived and our lifestyle and our choices and our values were then considered the right. 
And uh, there seems to be this strange reversal that Temba and I were uh, reminiscing about how things have changed since those days. Uh, Cecilia will address us on these and related issues. For the older generation, there's all sorts of new terminology, uh, which I hope you will define for us, because you might be familiar with uh, its meaning simply because you're young. Uh, but those of us who are a bit older uh, aren't necessarily familiar with it, especially because there is this sort of reinvention of what Sam Harris calls the regressive left. I hate these terms left and right because on many of the issues concerned, I consider myself radically left-wing, uh, for example, on gender issues. And I remember a bumper sticker I once saw that said uh, on the abortion issue, I'm pro-choice. And then it had dot, dot, dot on everything. <laughs> and uh, so I think that is what distinguishes a, a liberal from <coughs> any other ideological position. And we'll hear some of that, I believe. Cecilia is Head of Research and Advocacy Projects at the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom. And for those who don't know, it is a German foundation, goes back many years, and has had some illustrious people in it and heading it and associated with it and has produced an extraordinary uh, elaborate literature and is in fact one of the few places where I've read uh, a description of the rule of law, which it's an advocate of. It's an NGO, as it says, that promotes constitutional democracy, human rights, the rule of law, and a social market economy. And uh, it's one of the few places where I've read a description of the rule of law, which is the way I studied it, Dicey and Jennings and co., which is that it involves the separation of powers and involves laws that are objective and, and accessible and not retroactive and so on. And the separation of powers alone, for example, is f for practical purposes disappeared in South Africa. We now have government agencies in the executive that make laws, implement laws, adjudicate laws, uh, and do all the functions of government in one branch of government, namely the executive. So the rule of law, uh, for practical purposes, in my view, at least in its traditional sense, if it has a modern sense at all, which I doubt, essentially no longer exists. And the Nauman Foundation is one of the few places that describes the rule of law in its classical meaning and propagates it. Um, and then in, uh, in this role, her role as, as head of research and advocacy projects, uh, she heads up the organization Civil Society and Environmental Projects in South Africa. She holds a BA, LLB and an MA in Applied Ethics at Wits University. And with that, I am very happy to introduce you to Cecilia, who is not sure whether, having said what she plans to say, she will still have a job or a career. She might, like others we know, be defrocked or go to jail or whatever for having said something politically insensitive or correct. And I said to her, that is absolutely wonderful. I hope you do. I hope you shock us. And anyone who can't, handle, who can't handle straight talk uh, should leave now. Uh, but if you can handle it, I offer you the straight talk of Cecilia. Thank you. My goodness, what an introduction. <laughs> right. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Yes, I know. <laughs> This is probably one of the most overquoted quotes of all time, but uh, and we've all heard this line by Martin Luther King Jr. many, many, many times. However, I think that right now its importance cannot be overstated because this dream is in danger. And this time the danger not only comes from the right, but also from the left, as, as uh, Leon has already suggested. Martin Luther King Jr. was a son of the Enlightenment the Enlightenment project has been to bring about a move away from the significance attached to any kind of social group, such as nationality, race, gender, religion. It is a move rather toward the importance of the individual, ideas, and values. It is an embrace of humanism, rationality, and a shift away from allowing arbitrary features, accidents of birth, to define us. On this basis, many political movements in the past have sought to dismantle systems in which arbitrary identity played a role. 
First wave feminists fought for the right to vote. In the US, the civil rights movement fought against the injustice of institutionalized racial segregation. And in South Africa, various movements railed against the panoply of apartheid injustices, including this one. Although the issue of identity lay at the heart of these movements, this was so because they aimed to eliminate the importance of identity in political life. The objective was to view people primarily as individuals rather than as tokens of alleged social groups. However, identity in the political usage of the term, this is also a complicated thing because we use the term identity in very different ways. And of course, um, there's a conflation that sometimes occurs. Um, so identity in the political usage, so relating to re um, nationality, race, gender, etc., has again come to take center stage in political life. This time round, instead of trying to do away with its importance, there is a move to make social identity central. This is happening both on the right and on the left, and the louder each side grows, the more the other is riled up. This comes after a period which saw the end of the authoritarian regimes of the Soviet era and the seeming rise of democracy with individual rights at its center. The move toward liberal democracy as the seemingly inevitable form of government for prosperous and thriving societies was coupled with the growth of globalization and a belief that international cooperation was important to improving individual welfare around the world. The disenchantment with this worldview has given rise to responses on the left and on the right toward the primacy of social identity. In this talk, I'm going to set out the central tenets of identity politics on the right and on the left. And after that, I will briefly consider collectivism, which I take to lie at the heart of both movements. Um, and then I will critically evaluate the aims of the two movements. After having done this, I will examine how the views as practiced in the world today, and I, I'll focus on the left, um, stack up against the value of individual human freedom by looking through the lens of features that go hand in hand with individual human freedom, namely rationality, free speech and dignity. I conclude that they are generally not consistent with these features and therefore not with universal human freedom. Okay, so of course they're variances, but these are the central tenets of the two views. I'm going to start with the right wing, but before I start, um, I'm just going to note up front that um, right wing identity politics seems to be truly populist um, because it actually springs from the populist. There isn't a grand theory that uh, unites right wing identitarians. Right, tenet one. The primary social group is the nation state and the welfare of the nation state is to taken to be of primary importance. Tenet number two. National identity is the primary social identity. And in addition, some identitarians think race, religion, or sexuality form part of national identity. It depends on the kind of right-wing identitarian we're talking about. Tenet number three, globalization, cosmopolitanism, and immigration are viewed with suspicion by those who consider themselves the common people. And uh, all of these things are shunned in favor of national homogeneity, isolationism, and protectionism. Much of the growth of right-wing parties in countries such as Germany, Poland, Hungary, and Italy can be explained through these points. And the tenets are also quite evident in the reasoning, un reasoning underlying some of the Brexit uh, and Trump votes. Right, now I'm going to move to the left and briefly outline um, its ideology. Uh, but before I do that, it's quite interesting to contrast the origins of the left with the origins of the right identitarian movements. I have to be careful how I use these terms, as Leon pointed out. Um, right, the origin of the left populist movement are actually not populist um, in contrast to the right-wing uh, identitarianism, because the movement really springs out of postmodernism and critical theory uh, in humanities <coughs> faculties and is now widespread in tertiary um, institutions across the globe. And it seems to sort of filter into society from there certain levels of society. Right, tenet number one. Left-wing identitarians rely on notions of power structures that are skewed so that essentially, black people in relation to white people and women in relation to men lack power. Tenet number two. On the basis of these alleged power relations, left identitarians claim that the world is divided into the consciously or unconsciously privileged and the oppressed, where this is a zero-sum game. So for every privileged group, 
there is an oppressed group, and for every oppressed group, there's a privileged group. And I just want to also point out that uh, the usage of these terms is very different from the traditional usage of, of, of the words. Um, they have been enormously expanded. Um, this is what the theorists will tell us. Well, not many of them actually do define their terms, but those who do um, tell us this. Tenet number three. Popular Marxist theory claims that the bourgeoisie stands in a structurally exploitative relationship to the working class, and hence members of the bourgeoisie cannot act otherwise than as oppressors. And this framework is used by leftist identitarians to attribute to race and gender the kind of exploitative power that Marxists generally associate with class. The aim of the left identitarian analysis is thus not only just to point out the skewed power structures, but rather to usher in a world of social justice, similarly to classical Marxists. Um, Iris Marion Young is one of the very well-known um, leftist identitarian theorists, and she writes that, I quote, women are exploited in the Marxist sense to the degree that they are wage workers, and that, I quote again, race is a structure of oppression at least as basic as class or gender. Tenet number four. According to left identitarianism, a perspective from the oppressed group is more accurate than one from the privileged group. This speaks to the notion that the privileged and oppressed fundamentally experience the world in different ways um, and view the world in different ways. So Charles Mills, who is another famous identitarian theorist, um, writes, for example, that in understanding the workings of a system of oppression, a perspective from the bottom up is more likely to be accurate than one from the top down. So basically the idea is that power relations produce a widespread and widely written about distorted understanding of um, reality, and this is generally called an epistemology of ignorance, there's some jargon there, um, but basically it means that, um, for those whom societal structures serve. They are simply unable to comprehend the intrinsic way in which dominant societal arrangements favor them at the expense of other social groups. Tenet number five, left identitarians broadly claim that the morality of a person's actions depends on the social group to which they belong, rather than on the nature of the action. So um, Witt's academic Samantha Weiss, for example, argues that whites in South Africa ought to adopt, and I quote, a silence in the political realm as the morally decent policy, close quote in order to, open quote, to prevent one's whitely perspective from causing further distortion in the political and public contexts where whiteness is most problematic and charged. Uh, close quote, given that, open quote, the self is so thoroughly saturated by histories of oppression and privilege, close quote. Samantha's work has been quite influential in South Africa and uh, quite a well-known uh, radio presenter is a great fan of Samantha's work. <laughs> Um, anyway, clearly Weiss thinks uh, it is morally dubious for white people to be politically active in South Africa. Generally, talk of white privilege or male privilege can be traced to the left identitarian movement. This is where the language comes from. Also, talk of white men or, um, or men generally not being able to understand black pain or pervasive male privilege supports the idea that there are certain topics that white people or men ought not to talk about given their limited ability to understand or experience certain things um, in light of their relative power. And I'm going to move on to the topic of collectivism, which really, as you, as you I'm sure all know, lies at the heart of these two movements. Both identity politics movements have a very strong sense of social groups. Both view the social group as a source of identity and political action. Right-wing identitarians attach great significance to those who share their national identity. And again, depending on the kind of right-wing identitarian we're dealing with, race, religion, sexual mores, sexuality um, may play a role. There is a strong sense of solidarity between countrymen, primarily based on the arbitrary fact of being born in the same geographical location. There's an affiliation that is created in the minds of right-wing identitarians on the basis of nothing other than ultimately an accident of birth. No values or actions are taken into consideration. But not only is there a distinction between fellow citizens and others, there is a strong moral judgment that is made on this basis. Local good, foreign bad, or where race, sexuality, and sexual mores play a role. People like me, good. People not like me, bad. Uh, similarly to right-wing identitarians, left-wing identitarians attach great importance to social groups. 
specifically race and gender. Again, each individual is born into this world with absolutely no control over their race or gender. These are accidents of birth. And um, just as an aside, but I think this is a rather important aside, it's important to point out that identitarianism clearly thinks that race exists. But there's broad scientific consensus around the fact that there is no biological marker necessary or sufficient which, uh, to constitute race. In historical and current attempts at racial classification bear out this fact. Someone who's considered to be a member of the black race in the United States, for example, would not be considered to be black in Brazil. Many might claim that race and gender are social constructs. But when you ask people what this means, there's no answer. And uh, that's a huge problem because this question surely needs a very good answer because not only do identitarians on both sides allege the existence of race, but also that major moral claims flow from its existence. You know, all of this feeds into a grossly oversimplistic way of viewing individuals as binary in nature. One is either privileged or oppressed, a fellow countryman or a foreigner, good or bad. There seems to be very little to no space for nuance. And I, I just want to be clear um, on one point, uh, which is often fallaciously taken to follow from what I have said about race, namely a denial of the existence of racism. So uh, I think this is a particularly important point to uh, left-wing identitarians. Basically, the argument goes something like this. If you believe there's no such thing as race, you must deny the possibility of the existence of racism. Clearly, you believe there's no such thing as race, so you must deny the possibility of the existence of racism. But this uh, argument is false because race need not exist for racism to exist. I think this is a very important point. Racism, with potentially momentous consequences, is brought about by the false belief that people have about race in exactly the same way that women were persecuted and burned at the stake due to the false belief people had in respect to the existence of witches. It is quite evident that the notion of false beliefs in witches and races is, a very, diff is very different to the notion of actual witches and races. Okay, now I'm going to look at the aims of the two movements. At the very least, the right-wing identitarian movement is aiming for a state of exclusion. In other words, one that does not permit immigration. Special forms of right-wing identitarianism seem to demand not only exclusion, but also homogeneity, um, whether it be in terms of race, religion, sexual mores, sexual orientation. Uh, these views vary. Coupled with this is often a call for isolationism and the desire for an economically self-sufficient state. Those who, in the view of the right-wing identitarian, do not belong must go elsewhere and what happens to them is none of their concern. This end game seems to be a backward-looking chauvinistic project that seeks to undo the effects of globalization and cosmopolitanism. However, just how a state and its citizens could thrive, cut off from the world economically and politically, and with great restrictions around those who are allowed into the country, is left entirely unexplained. After all, one can exit the global community, shun globalization and cosmopolitanism, and isolate oneself all the way into a North Korean type state. And indeed, empirically, racial nationalism has as part of its track record some of the world's most heinous crimes. Nazi Germany and apartheid South Africa are prominent examples of national racial, racialism. Ultimately, it is entirely unclear how those who feel left behind would fare any better under an exclusionist state uh, than under one that is open to the world. And in fact, all the empirical evidence speaks to the opposite conclusion. The left's game is also unclear. Taken at its best, it seems to be a forward-looking enterprise that is aimed at emancipation by means of overthrowing oppressive power structures. The left today promotes racial and female representation, but it's entirely unclear that racial and female representation policies are the be-all and end-all in terms of the movement's aims. Instead, this strategy seems like plugging holes in a dike. Such measures suggest a constant battle um, against seemingly intractable power structures. On this view, the world is one of perpetual oppression and privilege predicated on race and gender, which constantly requires social engineering through preference policies. One can never overthrow the alleged existing power structures. Alternatively, I think this is probably the more charitable view, uh, perhaps such measures are conceived um, 
of as a necessary step to one of the two possible end states in which the current oppressive power relations will have been overthrown. So there's two options to this. Number one, perhaps the end state is a turning of the tables so that the oppressed become the privileged and the privileged become the oppressed. Number two, perhaps the end state is an equitable power relations. Option two to me seems to be the more charitable option. And so I'm going to look at this going forward. Given, um, so given the state, the following central questions remain unanswered by theorists of the identitarian left. A, how does racial and gender representation bring about equitable power relations between alleged races or genders, assuming this is the aim of such measures? And B, what exactly do equitable power relations actually look like? And how does one get to them? If we don't know how equitable power relations look like, how do we know whether we are on track or where to go? Given the centrality that power plays in these questions, I shall briefly consider the Marxist account of power um, that uh, this account of power seem, well, that this account seems to rely on in trying to grapple with the questions I have posed. So basically what I'll try and do is, on behalf of the identitarian, offer an account um, where the identitarian has not offered one. Okay, so to recap the Marxist power account, the rich class, the bourgeoisie, has power insofar as it exploits the labor of the poor, the proletariat. So applying the Marxist account of power in racial and gender terms yields the claims that white people exploit black people and men exploit women. However, um, one major problem with the Marxist notion of power is that it cannot account for those women and black people who are economically, socially, and politically well off or successful. Identitarians might respond by claiming that such instances are exceptions to the rule. They might say most women and most black people are oppressed. Citing exceptions to this does not alter the general state of affairs, they may say. These exceptional individuals, again, they may say, rose to their positions of success despite their oppression. And the reasons for their success will be due to other factors, divorce from gender and race. But there are various reasons why this response is unconvincing. And uh, I'm going to give you two. First, citing other factors is really vague and unhelpful. This account is therefore incomplete, and it seems incomplete in a major respect, given how influential these other factors appear to be. Second, if the identitarian admits that there are other factors that explain the success of individuals, why not also permit the possibility that these other factors may explain low economic, social, or political status of other individuals? It seems that the Marxist account is completely overly simplistic. It does not take into account a multivariate analysis of poor prospects in life. After all, it leaves out whether a given person has access to those opportunities and resources that they require to fulfill their goals in life. Healthy early childhood development, quality education, familial stability, safety, security, nutrition, job opportunities, <laughs> and quality health care, for example. Thus, the question as to whether a certain power, a person has power does not seem like the same question as whether that person is white or black. Rather, whether they have access to the resources and opportunities that they need to succeed in life. Other factors are doing the work here, not race or gender. Of course, however, the effects of the evils and harms caused, caused by past systematic oppression and discrimination against people on the basis of race and gender continue right into today. Race and gender in this way clearly have played an indirect role in the opportunities and resources available to people today. And this is obvious, and to deny this would be delusional and ahistorical. The point, however, is this. It's a simple one. Turning to a flawed account of power without any suggestion around how to address the alleged power relations is unhelpful to those who lack resources and opportunities. Rather, one would need to address the issue of access to resources and opportunities. Given all the problems with the Marxist account of power, which is what left-wing identitarians seem to rely on, the central question I raised earlier, or the questions I raised earlier, remain unanswered, and given the flawed notion of power at work in them, unanswerable. One objection um, to what I have said may 
go roughly as follows. Well, denying certain power relations seems awfully close to suggesting that we simply forget about past racial and gender injustice and ignore its lingering effects. And are we just going to ignore racism and sexism? There are, however, numerous responses to such an objection. First, it's clearly based on a false dilemma. Uh, the idea is that there's either one or the other. So either we use the notion of power relations to invoke privilege and oppression to deal with injustice, or we do not deal with it at all. This is not the case. There are other and clearly better ways of recognizing and de dealing with injustice, racism, and sexism. For example, one can point concretely to instances thereof in the world and attempt to resolve them instead of invoking vague power relations in an attempt to uh, claim the, the omnipresence of such wrongs. So if there is an instance of sexism, point it out so that it can be dealt with instead of invoking the vague notion of the patriarchy, divorced from concrete instances thereof of sexism. And this point equally applies to racism. <coughs> Second, the identitarian objection seems to imply that left identitarian theory has solutions to the problem of injustice, racism, and sexism. However, the movement does not seem to offer solutions, given that it fails to posit a plausible account of power on which it crucially hinges. And in light of this failure to provide a plausible account of power, it's entirely unsurprising that the movement also fails to give an account of what a state of equitable power relations would look like. Right, now I'm going to move to identity politics and individual freedom. So ultimately, right-wing identitarianism does not value universal individual human freedom. At most, and only on the face of it, it might care about the individual freedom of some. Rather, it seems, given that it sees competition for resources as a zero-sum game, that its focus is to bring about the well-being um, rather than the freedom of those it considers the people who count at the cost of the well-being and individual freedom of others. The identitarian left is very different in this sense. After all, taken at, at its most charitable, the left seems to want to overcome the oppressive power dynamics it alleges and thus also overcome the zero game system. It seems to be aiming at emancipation. And this, of course, holds huge appeal amongst those who care about injustice. Who would not want to stand on the side of dismantling a system of oppression? I shall now turn to examine primarily the left identitarian movement, um, given that the right doesn't seem to care very much about um, universal individual freedom. And I'll examine it today as we know it. Um, specifically, I will look at how it stacks up against the following three features, which we take to go hand in hand with individual freedom, namely rationality, freedom of speech, and the free flow of ideas, and dignity. While there are other such values, tonight I can't delve into them because I kind of don't have the time to do so. If the left identitarian movement's actions today are contrary to the very tenets of human freedom, what could the human emancipation it aims to bring about possibly look like? Instead of furthering human freedom, which is surely the aim of any kind of emancipation, um, I shall argue that the left-wing left identity politics seems to curtail it. Okay, so I'm going to start with rationality. When more importance is placed on the alleged identity of a person than on the content of a person's ideas, rationality is obviously sacrificed. The move toward identity politics is a move away from logic and reason. It's a move away from using carefully constructed logical arguments to test ideas for their soundness or to judge individuals on the basis of their character. Instead, the espousal or dismissal of ideas um, and of individual worth occurs on the one-dimensional and arbitrary basis of social group identity. Imagine, for example, that Deborah sits on a judicial appointment body. Deborah votes for a female candidate to become a, job, a judge because she is a woman like her. Deborah pays little regard to the uh, candidate's qualifications or value system. Deborah believes she is, as one hears rather often today, a woman standing up for another woman, a woman standing up for women in general, and a woman standing up against the patriarchy. Furthermore, Deborah may even assume this female candidate holds certain views in virtue of her gender. Deborah may think it's necessary for the bench to have enough women on it so that women's issues are dealt with the way she thinks they ought to be dealt with. She's not so confident a man could or would come to the right decisions when it comes to women's issues. 
Deborah may think, for example, that the female candidate shares her stance regarding female quotas, given that she's a woman. So the thing is, ideas are not gendered. There is absolutely no necessary connection between a particular idea and the gender of those that espouse that idea. And thus a person's gender can never tell us anything about their ideas or values. One can be female, for example, but vehemently against female quotas. It's dangerous to conflate a person with an idea. And we should also not reject an idea on the basis of the person who voices it. If I am not even open to listening to an idea because it's being articulated by a privileged white male, this would be the left, or a foreign Muslim woman, this would be the right, I am being an irrational agent. I would be committing what is known as the famous ad hominem fallacy. Likewise, ideas are not raced or aged. The value of an idea cannot be evaluated on the basis of its proponent. Right now to the limiting of free speech and the free flow of ideas. Both, both movements are set up in such a way so as to silence opponents. The right outright denies freedom to partake in a conversation and the left says only certain people can talk, talk in, about certain topics. Um, you just need to recall the, the Samantha Weiss quote. Just on this note, it's very interesting because very well, different theorists um, say to come to opposite conclusions. So th there's no clarity on when you are allowed to talk and when not. It's just a, it's quite a mess. Um, but there are two ways in which limiting a person's freedom of speech and the free flow of ideas is problematic in respect of individual freedom. First of all, it's a denial of the freedom of the person uttering the speech. So in the example, the so-called privileged white male, or in the right example, the foreign Muslim woman. The person concerned is from the start denied a voice in human interaction, debate, and conversation. To me, this seems like a rather serious denial of individual freedom. Secondly, as a receiver of the information being preferred, one is practicing self-denial of, of freedom to judge the content of a statement. Bizarrely, one is standing in the way of one's own freedom oneself. Right now to issues regarding dignity. A fundamental issue regarding the loss of dignity of, uh, of what the left sort of is pushing for is that of racial classification. Well, this goes for both, both sides, really. Um, and I did touch on this issue a little earlier. But in order for racial identity politics to get off the ground, one has to determine who counts as white and who counts as black. However, any system of racial classification is deeply undesirable. Um, it requires the kind of thinking that was espoused by a Nazi Germany or apartheid South Africa. And in South Africa, are we going to resort to the pencil test to see whether one qualifies as black for the purposes of, of identity politics? Also, who's going to decide who, get, who belongs to which racial group? The matter of categoriza categorization is extremely important given the very serious moral consequences that the movement alleges in connection to a particular race. In sum, any kind of racial classification of individuals is deeply distasteful, and it clears, clearly impairs the dignity of the individuals classified. Uh, it limits an individual's freedom, and also that there's no ability to opt out. It also encourages racial groupthink and the pigeonholing of people into particular races with particular connotations. In short, racial identity politics on the left and the right fosters racist thinking. It also cannot be reconciled with the value of non-racialism, which is enshrined as one of the founding provisions in the South African constitution. This is far too often forgotten. I shall now turn to consider preferential hiring in respect of race and gender. There are various reasons why racial or gender quotas or preferencing are harmful, primarily in respect of the individuals belonging to the preferenced group, ironically. Tonight, I'll focus only on one. Racial or gender preferencing undermines the achievements of the individuals belonging to the preferred groups. Carl Cohen uh, regard, writes re in relation to preferential hiring on the basis of race, and just note that exactly the same can be said for gender. Uh, qu open quote. It imposes upon every member of the preferred race the demeaning burden of presumed inferiority. Preferences create that burden. It makes a stigma of those who are preferred by race. An ethnic group given special favor by the community is marked as needing a special favor, and the mark is borne prominently by every one of its members. 
nasty racial stereotypes are reinforced, and the malicious imputation of inferiority is inescapable because it is tied to the color of skin or gender. Another quote from Cohen's book testifies to the anguish that many members of a preferred racial group feel as a result of racial preference policies. You always want to believe you were hired because you were the best, but everything around you is telling you you were brought in for one reason, because you were a quota. No matter how hard I worked or how brilliant I was, it wasn't getting me anywhere. It's a hell of a stigma to overcome. Just recently, we have seen the problems of preferential hiring on the basis of race come to the fore in the Mark Lamberti case. Mark Lamberti resigned from his position as chief executive of Imperial Holdings after the Gauteng local division of the High Court mm -hmm. held that he had impaired the dignity of a colleague by referring to her as an employment equity employee. The court is right that there is an impairment of dignity, but this is in no way due to Mark Lamberti. It is the law of our country which enforces racial, racial hiring practices that is the cause of the impairment of, of dignity. This is the epitome of Orwellian doublethink. It surely cannot be that one can champion racial and gender preferencing on the one hand and then take offense at the mention of it on the other. You just can't do that. A possible objection to the arguments I have offered around gender and racial preferencing may be the following. Well, one's dignity may be impaired through the preference policies, but it is impaired to a far greater extent without gender and racial preferencing, as, a woman, as women and black people would not get a foot in the door in the first place. I would rather have my dignity impaired in the way you suggest it would be than have it impaired to a greater extent by not getting the job at all. There are numerous responses to this, and here's one response. The objection again would be based on a false dilemma. Either gender and racial preferencing will enable a significant amount of women and black people, especially in certain industries, to get jobs, or jobs will mainly go to white men if there are no preferencing policies. Clearly, it's not one or the other. There, there are other options. For example, instead of engaging in constant social engineering and treating individuals as tokens of their alleged racial group or gender in order to, to achieve a particular outcome, one might look at creating the correct framework conditions so that there is equality of opportunity. This would involve assessing many factors, such as early childhood development, stable fam familial environments, um, primary, secondary, and tertiary education, <coughs> access to bas basic resources, etc. It would also involve looking carefully at hiring processes so as to make sure that they are not biased. One may also want to consider non-racial affirmative action in setting up a society of equality of opportunity. Such affirmative action would solve the issue of the nasty racial stereotypes and target those who deserve compensation for past and pre or present injustice without having to go through racial classification. After all, there is no need for race to serve as a proxy for disadvantage if one can go straight to disadvantage. One would do this by looking at a basket of historical and socioeconomic factors. Thus, one alternative vision of justice is one of equality of opportunity, not of outcome. After all, it is also questionable whether perfect racial representation across all sectors would be a sign of a just society, given the unavoidable interference with people's freedom, as well as the nasty gender and racial inferiority stereotypes that go hand in hand with gender and racial preferencing. A society in which individuals, regardless of their background, alleged race or gender, are able to reach their full potential through access to resources and opportunities is an alternative to the one that is socially engineered to reflect the social demographics of a country. A vivid example to illustrate this point is the donut industry in California. In California, 90% of donut stores happen to be owned by Cambodians. And there seems nothing unjust in Cambodians having what may appear to be a disproportionate share in the industry. If racial quotas were applied, then almost all the Cambodians running donut stores would be forced to sell their businesses to members of other racial groups. What left identitarians may view as racial clustering in certain sectors is thus not necessarily connected to past discrimination or injustice or some kind of power relation. Industries can become dominated by particular racial groups purely by chance. 
Strong racial identity politics also impairs the dignity and freedom of speech of individuals by fostering self-censorship in both what is considered the privileged group and in the oppressed group. Individuals may be made to believe that they cannot speak or act in certain situations because of the racial group they allegedly belong to. As already mentioned at the beginning of my talk, Witz academic Samantha Weiss, for example, argues that whites in South Africa ought to adopt a silence in the political realm, and here I quote again, silence in the politi political realm as the morally decent policy in order to, and here I quote again, to prevent one's whitely perspective from causing further distortion in the political and public contexts. In this quote, there is mention of a whitely perspective. Whiteliness, apparently according to the left, comes apart, left identitarians, um, comes apart from whiteness as a skin color. So one can get whitely black people. Um, according to the identitarian left, such individuals then have been brainwashed to think in whitely ways. Um, what exactly makes something a whitely thought, however, is never explained. I have looked and there is no explanation for this. It's, it's, it's exactly that, it's based on Marxist false consciousness. Given this notion of whiteliness, the left appears to want to dictate adherence to certain, to the left acceptable, social scripts on the basis of race. And the notion of cultural appropriation also speaks to this point. So if one does not toe the identitarian line, one must either be brainwashed or a porch negro. This is the kind of demeaning language that Gwen and Gwenya, the COO of the Institute of Race Relations at the time, and now the DA's head of policy, had to endure in a meeting uh, where she opposed the fallest line at UCT. Gwen and Gwenya wrote, holding these views, i.e. the ones contrary to the fallists, as a black South African comes with significant consequences. For the transgression of not conforming with the loudest black voices, I apparently deserved nothing less than to be racially insulted and defamed. The identitarian right seems entirely unconcerned about universal freedom or universal individual freedom. It is focused instead on the well-being of a few without stating what that well-being actually looks like or how it would be achieved by the measures that it promotes. On this basis and in light of the empirical track record of states that share or have shared this notion, it really ought to be viewed with, at the very least, deep suspicion. If the identitarian left's actions today in aiming at human emancipation do not further universal individual freedom, which is surely at the heart of emancipation, it is entirely unclear how it can achieve emancipation at all. Added to this, its theoretical foundations, given the absence of a plausible account of power, and based on that, uh, a plausible account of equitable power relations, are deeply unsound. In sum, either we can experiment with and tweak two very controversial ideologies that have the social group at their core, or on the basis of the indisputable incremental gains, gains the world has been making when attempting to realize the kind of universal individual freedom Martin Luther King Jr. had in mind, we continue to try and realize this kind of freedom wherever it is lacking. Ultimately, the individual and not the alleged social group ought to be our starting point. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. You didn't let me down. I hope you didn't let anyone else down. She will take questions. And uh, being the scholar that she is, I'm sure she finds the questions all easy, <laughs> even if she doesn't know the answers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, I'm going to let you manage. Okay, I'll, I'll manage. I, you, you Sebastian, your hand went up. Uh, look, uh, you, you drew some fantastic parallels uh, between the modern mutation of Marxism, Leninism, that is now calling itself an uncritical theory. And, uh, and the sort of the right wing, perhaps, you, you didn't so much touch on this, on its genesis, perhaps, from the older Nazi regimes, you, although, although you did touch on, on the connection. Now, the question is, uh, or rather the point here, is that both of them um, avow, they espouse the use of violence as a legitimate means mm. against the groups that one dislikes. You know, Marxist-Leninists mm -hmm. would overthrow the bourgeoisie, the 
Nazis would overthrow the Jews. Now we want to overthrow straight white um, heterosexual men and uh, Muslim immigrants. You know, ultimately, at what point does would you say um, a resistance to those ideologies warrant violence on behalf of everybody else? Sure. In our, uh, like there is, you know, there's there's a big question: Is it moral to punch a Nazi? Is it moral to punch a social justice warrior? First prize is if they could wipe each other out. But second prize is, at, at what stage does it become legitimate then to use that against them because we know that it is inherent in their ideology to justify the use of violence? I'm quite a believer in conversation and that's why I, I think I, I've you know, given the talk that I have because frankly what needs to happen more is an engagement with these ideas. Um, because these ideas are just floating out there and uh, various notions that are clearly based on left identitarian theory are just being accepted without being questioned properly. Um, and so what, what I think really needs to happen is, uh, is a mobilization of ideas against these dangerous ideas. I mean, the thing is, you know, you can't, you can't just let discourse um, get away because it seems to be motivated by justice. A lot of really bad things have happened in the name of so-called justice. Um, and these ideas have dangerous backgrounds and we need to make people aware of this. I think a lot of people might say, oh, tying the today's left identitarian movement to um, you know, Marxist regimes is a bit far. Then again, you know, that it, is, it, is the correct, it is the correct forerunner of the leftist identitarian movement because you know, they're going back to Marxist power structures, at least explicitly in the text that I have studied. Um, but uh, again, I think, it's, I think it's very, very important not to self-censor um, around this topic. And I think that is what's happening at the moment, and I think that's very dangerous. With, with, with respect, if you allow me a follow-up question, you yourself <laughs> say that the right will delegitimize and de invalidate everything that's a Muslim uh, female immigrant would have to say. The left also automatically invalidates everything that a white heterosexual male would have to say. So how is dialogue then possible if people are deplatformed, disqualified, disinvited, and simply shut down and censored? You know, perhaps it's, we should be taken as an indication that th those, uh, neither of the sides in fact wants a dialogue or a conversation. You know, and, it sounds and it like be, you're about to take up the arms. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it would be foolish to, to, because going on the historical record, it, it perhaps would be short-sighted to expect that a dialogue would sort out. You see, the thing is, uh, the right-wing identitarian movement doesn't seem to be concerned about uh, arguments. It doesn't seem to be concerned about matters of justice. It doesn't seem to be concerned about a better world or a better life for all. I think the left one can speak to. Um, because the stuff is, you know, deeply rooted in, in theory. And the, th the point is, if, if you point out the, the enormous holes in that theory, the crucial holes, I mean, if, if, you're, tr if you're pushing for particular action now and uh, you have no idea where it's supposed to lead, that's a real problem. Um, and that ought to be a problem for left identitarians too. So I think what we really need to do is, you know, when, when people talk about power, ask, what do you mean by power? How does it work? What, what is its machinery? Um, how does it manifest? How do you know how it, when it's there and when it's not? These are, these are questions that need to be asked. Um, and we, we can't just assume, because the problem is that most often these power relations are just assumed, they're never argued for. Um, but I, th I think it's really important to push this stuff because, uh, you know, there, there's so much action going on um, and very little thought about where it's all leading. Uh, and I think, I think if you say, well, if you ask, what is, the, what is your end game? I mean, I've asked identitarian theorists this. I've asked some of the theorists that I've, well, one of the theorists that I've quoted tonight. And she didn't have an answer. And yet she's putting, she's pushing out articles um, in philosophy journals and having a huge influence on South African society and societies all over, you know, based on these ideas, that's very dangerous to me. I think, I think it's hugely problematic, and I think that kind of stuff needs to be pointed out. Yes, at the back there. More of a maybe a statement rather than a question might like respond to it. Racists are damaged to people, and the first thing that we should do is pity them. How can we take a small lady who made a private comment 
to somebody else and it went viral and she was fined 100,000 rand, I think it was Miss Sparrow. Why do we allow that to take over the discourse except for saying that white person has done it? So all white people will do it. Being a racist is a waste of energy. It is destructive. And finally, if we reject each other, we are part of the problem. If we accept each other and listen to each other, we can be part of the solution. Absolutely. Then, uh, Dave? Um, thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Cecilia. Um, to what extent do you think that this phenomenon is a product of our modern uh, media technology and the way that we consume media, so social media, but also how traditional media has changed and has become much more partisan, ideological, and how you get echo chamber effects through the technology, like through algorithms that give you the content that you know that you that it knows that you will like. Um, or is this phenomenon uh, something that's always existed, this kind of binary thinking that there's us and them, and this is somehow ingrained in the way in which we, we view the other? So the theorists go a couple of decades back, but I do think that um, social media certainly, as you've stated already, um, it, it fuels those echo, ch echo chambers. Um, and, you know, given where the stuff comes from, universities, uh, you know, it, it's, it really feeds into um, debates that journalists will have, you know, all the people who've, who've been to university and who've spent a lot of time in certain humanities faculties. So um, I, th I think it plays an enormous role. Uh, I mean, it's, it's an empirically interesting question um, whether these views are terribly widespread or whether they really are in, in particular layers of society. Um, that's, that's, you know, that stuff hasn't been tested as far as I know, and if you do know of uh, things that uh, would alert me to numbers, I'd be very interested. But I completely agree with you. I do think that social media has had an enormous impact <coughs> on flaring debates that detract from all sorts of other things, um, yeah, which is very dangerous. Uh, then I think Mark had a question. So yeah, first of all, thank you for such an excellent talk. I think you covered um, yeah, yeah, very yeah, difficult yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, very difficult topics uh, in a very clear, precise, and entertaining way. So I applaud you on that basis. And I also applaud uh, your championing of using ideas to persuade people as opposed to taking up arms. I hope we're not there yet. Um, but I know that uh, you and Jason Werbelow, who's also here tonight, are working on uh, a wonderful new podcast called Let's Start an Argument. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you're going to be talking about? Thank you. I, I, will. <laughs> I will. But firstly, I do want to thank... Uh, Jason Werveloff, Dr. Jason Werveloff and Mark Offenheimer for the invaluable comments and insight um, that have really uh, helped shape the talk tonight. Uh, basically, yeah, Jason and I um, have started producing a new podcast which will be, which will be launched um, towards, probably toward the end of the year um, on Cliff Central. It's called Let's Start an Argument. And it really is about um, dealing with the tenets of left-wing identitarianism. So we discuss um, the nature of race, for example, the nature of power. We examine various power accounts, for example, you know, and, and look at what the identitarian might be able to rely on. We look at this notion of um, experience and um, perspective of the world um, that is alleged to be so different uh, by the identitarians, uh, you know, regarding those in oppressed positions and regarding those in privileged positions. And we also look at um, accounts of justice and we, we look at affirmative action, various affirmative action models. Um, and there's, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure to, to make the series with Jason. We are still trying to get guests on the show who disagree with us. We've written to numerous very um, public figures who, you know, put forward these ideas um, and have been turned down every single time, or we just don't get an answer, which is a great pity because we think it's incredibly important to 
be able to converse with people who disagree with us. Um, so if anyone knows of anyone <laughs> who, you know, ideally has a public platform and um, is, is, is putting the stuff out there, I th you know, if, the, if anyone knows of anyone who'd be interested in, in coming onto our show who disagrees with us, we would really love that. Um, I think that's incredibly important. I mean, this is how we think we make progress. Um, it's not that we'll, they'll be seen as opponents. I mean, ultimately, what Jason and I are interested in is getting to some kind of truth. Um, and so, please, um, do let me know. Uh, Leon has all my details. So that, that would be really, really great. Um, I'm, I'm now can't tell, there, was a lot, there were a lot of hands here. Um, he, I'm not sure who was, okay, no, he, he, okay. Asia, come first. Thank you for your address. I'm still working out what it all means. <coughs> you used the number of terms which you use as givens. Now, privileged white male seems to imply that if you're white and you're male, by definition, you're extremely wealthy. That's not the case. So it becomes a meaningless term. How do you define the word uh, privileged white male, privileged white, uh, white female, and presumably privileged black male or black female? So these are um, good questions, and there's not much content in the literature. It, it really just is this opposition between um, privilege and oppression. So normally we don't think about uh, the opposite of privilege being oppression, but um, the left has sort of redefined terms. Um, and privilege, and the problem is very few theorists define them. So it's, <laughs> they're such slippery notions and they are just taken as givens and that is part of the problem, right? But let me just see if I can find my Ar Iris Marion Young quotes. I'm not sure if I, uh, no, I'm not, I'm not sure I'll have them here. But um, I can get the, the definition that Iris Marion Young gives, who's one of the very few left identitarian theorists who gives a, um, a definition. Basically, she talks about um, oppression generally, for example, being, uh, you know, a coerced force by some tyrannical power. Um, but the, the, the way the left uses the term, it's even actions in a well-meaning liberal society, and I think she even talks about education and healthcare and all that sort of thing, playing, so the, the, all of these things can, can, can filter into the notion of oppression um, and thus uh, privilege. It's, it's very confusing stuff and that is exactly part of the reason why it's so confusing. So, because I mean, I, uh, these, are, these are not my terminology, it's the left, it's, it's the left identitarian terminology. Um, but you point out one of the, the central problems with it um, and that is the lack of definition of terms. And the problem is that these old, the old meanings of these terms carry through, you know. Oppression is like a pretty big deal. It's a very weighty word uh, and carries very serious connotations and to just sort of throw it around um, is, is dangerous because it's, it's conflating all sorts of stuff. Um, so yeah, I'm afraid that's the best answer I can give you at the moment. Well, I mean, that's why I think it's dangerous to use the you know, privileged white male. <coughs> There's no such animal. There are certain people, you've also got to define the word privilege, which yeah. means you've got something which you're not really entitled to. Mm -hmm. But if you're white, if you're male, you've worked really hard and you've been successful, why you must, must you be slapped in the face? Yeah, it's this, it's, as I say, it's based on this power relation thing, um, and these are the, this is the terminology they use. Um, yes. yes. Thanks, uh, for your talk. Just on the <coughs> subject of the bait that you thought about, you were literally begging and inviting. Yes. <laughs> don't you think the whole point of these groups is that they don't want to bait? They, the whole point of this is about power and politics and populism, in my view. So it's not as if they are desperate, like we might be, to get an understanding. They don't want an understanding. They just use these ideas to get whip up emotion, yeah. lie to people, like follow me, we can invade this and we'll grab land, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. I think these are similar things. I think populism is, is part of it all. So I'm not sure one is going to get this debate going because I don't mm -hmm. think they want to come out and stand for really what they believe. They just want to influence those who don't really think about these issues and how dangerous they are in society. In our experience, you're exactly right. It's, it's such a pity, but it does seem to be the case. Um, I hope it's not. I mean, we, st we still have some hope of getting some uh, discussion going, especially because our series is called Let's Start an Argument, and it would be awfully sad <laughs> if we were the only two interlocutors on this show. So I really do hope that we can get things going. I think, Hugh, you've had, you've had your hand up for a while. Yeah. 
Thanks very much. Um, I think inherent in much of what you've said tonight, I think the major component of what you've said tonight is stop labelling people. And you'd think that here in South Africa we have seen the economic and other follies, the cruelty of labelling people, and you would think that we of all people are sensitive to that. And yet with current trends, um, it's interesting to see that again we're starting to label and what have you and how stupid that is. I don't really want to ask a question, but I'd like to make a point, and it might be perceived as a commercial point, but it's not. Arising out of the recent debacle or sadness uh, which occurred with the rugby commentators, they were, one of them um, left the, the, the commentary because they uh, considered that they were being um, labelled in a prejudicial way. And resulting from that, um, the Castle Lager component of SA Breweries have taken the labels off their bottles um, in sympathy with us. And I think that's very significant. And I don't have any shares in SA Breweries, and I really drink Castle Lager. <laughs> but I think it's worth um, mentioning and recording that here is a commercial organisation, and our commercial organisations in, in this country are not known uh, for uh, points of, of philosophical principle and what have you, who has made that point? Some of us may be cynical and say, well, they're doing it to make money and what have you. And I think whatever the motive, that is a major organisation which is following the very point that you're making tonight. Stop labelling people. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at the yes. back there and then... Yes, I think there was something missing from the talk that... Uh, the whole thing is, um, the question is what is actually identity? Is it something that really exists or is it something that is, um, is made up or invalid? Or uh, what is the, 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 the social function maybe of identity? Mm. I think that is, um, there are certain premises to the talk that one should have discussed uh, before that. Mm. And actually I think that may actually, if one addresses it, uh, it would uh, probably resolve a lot of issues that uh, just stem from from types of uh, misunderstanding that uh, may have arisen or may uh, may be wi widespread on that. I agree that uh, that that, and I, I think I alluded to the fact that um, the word identity is is used in very different ways, uh, and I think that's very interesting. I mean, we th when we think about personal identity, we think about an individual's desires, hopes, dreams, characteristics. I mean, there's so much that goes into the notion of personal identity. Um, just to get the, my points off the ground, I suppose I, I, I needed to assume a, um, you know, a definition of, of identity um, as it's used in, in politics and uh, generally what, what, what the term refers to in, in this usage is notions of race, nationality, religion, and stuff. I completely agree with you. I think that would be a very interesting talk to have. Um, th there are so many <laughs> uh, interesting talks to to give or um, but th this yeah unfortunately one can't touch on everything in the limited time and I think I went over time already um, but I, I think that's a very very interesting issue and ought to be unpacked more again it's this it's this weird use of of, of language in two very different ways um, you know the one is this very idiosyncratic it's very it's a very particular um, it d denotes very particular characteristics of a person. The other, you know, connects people on the basis of accidents of birth. So I, I agree. I think it's a very important point. Um, Gabriel. So do you have time for that one? Um, I don't know. I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> so I, I, I sort of an unformulated question, so forgive me. And uh, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you very much. But I thought I'd offer a, a mild rebuttal, which may not be one. I don't want to accuse you of making a straw man argument because obviously the identity politics of the left that you're discussing is real people. You've given us quotes, these actual academics and speakers that you, you're talking about. But I wonder what you would say to a milder version. For example, my thought is with, when it comes to modern political correctness, do we find it socially unacceptable in polite society not to use the K word or the N word or the C word? Um, and I'm purposely not saying the words because I don't think it's appropriate to, to, to use them. Um, even, I suppose, when one's talking about them, one can. But that is something that seems to have come from identity politics in the left. And it it's a, it's a, impacts our freedom of speech. 
Um, but it's something that, and I realize I'm saying this in the context, again, you know, I think today it is that they are discussing passing this bill on hate speech in, in, in Parliament. So I, I'm not talking about that extreme position where there's some uh, criminal censure for speaking in a certain way, but what would you say to the argument, as I said, it's a more watered-down argument, that there's some good in, in um, recognizing the injustice of the past by, change, by limiting our, our freedom of speech and limiting it others by um, treating them as disdain or not inviting these people to your parties, etc. <laughs> <laughs> so to me that seems like a, a matter of respect. Um, I think it's just decent not to call, run around calling people names. Um, it's not something that I've really come across in the literature, or yeah, it's not, not a phenomenon that I really generally associate with the, with the left identitarian movement as I've studied it. Um, as it's, it's, it's a very um, theoretical sort of uh, focus that I've had, simply because I've, you know, if, if you deal with um, general I identitarian thoughts, uh, you're accused of straw manning um, the movement, and what I've tried to do is not straw man the movement, by going to the critical texts of the, of the left identitarian movement and studying those. So that hasn't been, it's just not something that hasn't been on my radar, but um, intuitively and off the cuff, I would assume that that would be a matter more of res just a general basic respect um, rather than any sort of, um, I, I just can't see the tenets of, of um, left identitarianism really seriously informing um, maybe a position like that. Um, but yeah, there's one, one more. Uh, I don't know, Leon, can I ask? Uh, uh, it's up to you. Um, uh, nobody's sure. walked out, so obviously. <laughs> Please feel free to walk <laughs> out. There's also freedom of uh, movement no, we don't in have this time room. Cutting off, uh, we, we, we tenants here, so we can stay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but thanks, it's going well, and I think maybe two more. Okay. The yeah, I just want to say, I mean, on the questions of the that the person at the front just brought up. I mean, I, I'm very much for free speech, and I often think that um, taking up debates, we need more free speech, not less, because uh, we need more discussion. And um, we need to look past the labels. I don't even agree with the Castle Lager thing, because they're actually making a big thing about this label of being called a quota black, you know, which is, as you just said earlier, is one of the problems with this affirmative action type of employment. And um, if you're a stronger person, you know, you would just, I mean, it, it's going to happen because of, of the way things are, but you would just, um, you would prove yourself in another way and not take, you know, I think a lot of people just um, would wave aside that label and prove themselves, you know. Um, so I, I kind of think, um, in my response to the castle thing, I would say, you know, we need to look past the labels and look at the content of what people are actually saying and deal with the content. I think that's how you started the argument. Because if I think about it, a lot of uh, people who may have grown up in, in different circumstances, not their fault, you know, whatever, older people or people in isolated communities may use words that, you know, we probably don't think are, are very nice, but it's just that's how they were brought up. And they don't mean anything bad by it, it's just that is their vocabulary. Um, and I think um, often they don't mean, they're not meaning to be racist, you know, you need to look at the content of what someone's saying rather than immediately blanch at uh, the words they're using. Mm, and uh, exactly, and, and the context. Um, so that just it reminds me of, um, yeah, de a debate that one can have around um, humor and what's appropriate to say f for what people. So you know, as a German, can I make a Holocaust joke? Um, you know, as a German Nazi, can I make a Holocaust joke? Who can make you know who can make such jokes? Like that is that is a topic that um, Professor David Benatar has written on. Um, and his work is always excellent, so I, I recommend uh, taking a look at that particular article. It's not something that I've, I've dealt with, um, but it's a, it's a, that's an interesting, I suppose, topic on its own. And yeah, I think maybe that was, it's, maybe it's a bit connected to yeah, your, your point, Gabriel. Um, okay, last one. Jason, I'm quite scared. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not a criticism, it was a fantastic speech. Uh, thank you. So um, it's just a, a potential solution to something Gabriel said okay. and has come up uh, in some of the other questions. So the identitarian movement might be seen as a political movement. Mm. So it's a movement about uh, what policies government should have, 
um, and how we should regulate people's activities in their speech, as mm -hmm. Leon said. Um, but uh, you know, when you're looking at issues around free speech and you're looking at issues around whether when someone says the K word or the C word or the N word, whether it's, whether it's appropriate or not, it might be a moral issue rather than a political issue. So uh -huh. you might say, you have hurt me by saying kappa, you have hurt me, but you have not committed an illegal action. So you could, as a libertarian, still hold that those kinds of activities, those, that kind of speech is wrong, but should not be made illegal. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And the, the, the thing is that, um, I mean, you've aptly pointed out the nature of these movements. I mean, that's why these movements, you know, belong to uh, the school of thought known as identity politics. There's a reason that the word politics features there. Um, it's, it's pushing a political agenda. So uh, that is important to bear in mind. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks, Leon. <laughs>
there is greater equality by every objective criterion than there has ever been before by a very big margin in every conceivable sense. The square meters of housing, access to medical care, uh, life expectancy, uh, access to the vote, etc., etc. By any objective definition, the world has never been anything like as equal as it is now in material and non-material terms. And yet you have uh, the um, Piketty's and the um, Oxfam's and so on of the world uh, misrepresenting just very simple, directly, easily available objective facts. You can look up any statistic you like on, on any objective measure, the you know, access to food or painkillers or medical care or housing or safe water or toilet facilities or, or uh, income levels or technology or whatever it might be, and the world is becoming very rapidly, astoundingly equal. The other one that we hear about endlessly from the left is poverty. These per gender, these power relations are also imply that somehow the people that are oppressed, who are oppressed, are less, have less, uh, are, are impoverished in some way. Again, this is just empirically nonsense. On, on, on steroids, it's nonsense. Uh, as people like uh, Norberg and Simon and Pinker uh, point out with every statistic, there is no statistic that says that anyone is getting poorer anywhere unless you find a small, very strange pocket of people somewhere that doesn't feature in the available data. Uh, on the contrary, uh, people defined as poor in the 1960s and 70s uh, were then about a third of all humanity. That figure has now fallen to below 5%. In other words, poverty has originally and objectively defined as virtually disappeared. Instead of celebrating that, we are behaving as if it's worse. So the, uh, the, the left uh, seems to do this. And the other big hole in definitions is you mentioned some now, you know, what do, what do these identities really all mean? Uh, I did a paper to the Philosophical Society in the 1970s and the topic was uh, the concept of class in social science, for which I did quite a lot of research. And the astounding thing was I could not find class defined anywhere. And uh, in the final volume of the three volumes of Das Kapital, the final chapter, if I'm not mistaken, it was chapter 10, it starts off with Karl Marx saying, all that now needs to be done is for us to define what we mean by class, or words to that effect. <laughs> so the entire gigantic, prolific edifice of Marx and Marxism and Marxists before and since uh, hinges on an assumption that there's a definition of class. But when he sets about wanting to define it, the next line in brackets says, at this point, the text leaves off full stop. In other words, he just never went on with it. But then, thankfully, Lenin picked it up and finished for us and said, well, in fact, we have no idea what class means. It's very complicated and they're cross-cutting classes and definitions. And so this has been a feature, I believe, of the left, is not to define its terms, including such common popular ones now as poverty and inequality. What on earth do they mean? And, uh, and for that matter, power. What does it mean? Uh, as for identity politics, uh, I was on ANN 7 debating on Dile in Katima, and uh, he said, I'm a front for white monopoly capital, and I'm a, as a, uh, I'm a, uh, you know, um, I'm a sexist and a racist, and so on. And when I said to him, why do you say that? All you know about me uh, you know nothing about my past. You know nothing about whether I, where I was during apartheid, what I was doing, what my views were in the struggle. You know nothing about my current level of wealth, or what I, you know, my, my living standards, or uh, with whom I associate. And his answer was that you're a white male is all I need to know about you. Now you don't get stronger identity politics than that. And from that, he believed he could conclude to the minutest detail what I think about everything. And um, then, uh, if I may say um, that I think we're dealing here with uh, something that I believe needs to be talked through. I find that if I talk to people, let's call it the left, I consider myself in many senses to be on the left, but for shorthand purposes, let's call it the left. I find actually surprisingly that there's a lot I can talk about. 
You know, for example, this role reversal that's taken place, uh, the whole puritanical view to lifestyle, whether you smoke and eat fat and exercise and obese, you're obese and have sugar and drink alcohol and so on, of course, started as a right-wing puritanism, particularly Hitler was very, very big on on, on that what's wrong with all of these lifestyle things, and a Puritan, that you are a physical being, must be physically healthy, how you feel is completely irrelevant. Uh, that then became the position of the left. And uh, it's quite interesting how a far radical right-wing position is now a radical left-wing position, down to the minutest detail. So, for example, it was said by the Nazi health uh, officials that uh, smoking and eating sugar and fat and living unhealthy lifestyles has no benefits. Our current uh, nicotine Nazi um, minister, uh, what's it, I keep forgetting his name, uh, Motswiledi, says precisely the same thing. Now, by the lack of benefits, I've never smoked. I'm a lifelong smoker and I hate smoking. But nonetheless, Clearly, people enjoy it, and the World Health Organization says it has all sorts of extraordinarily important benefits. Combats uh, depression, combats loneliness, combats social uh, uh, inability to socialize, co uh, helps with concentration, combats various uh, psychological conditions, and so on, and it also helps people reduce overeating, eating disorders, over drinking, drinking disorders, and so on. But the point is that not being depressed, for example, is not considered a benefit. Being physically healthy, chemically healthy, is considered the only relevant thing that used to be the position of the right. It was about having physically healthy people. It is now the position of the left, total role. The other big one, of course, is globalization. When I was at uh, university and a Marxist, the whole thing was the, the world should have no borders. It's all about class, and internationalism was the big thing, hence terms like common turn. Then it became the position of the right, globalization, free trade, open markets. Now it's gone back again, it's, it's flip-flopped back again. The roles have gone the other way, back to the, where they were in the 60s and 70s. So yes, I, I think these issues uh, need endless addressing. I do agree with you that you can talk and be persuaded. When I point out to people on the left that there is a spectacular reduction in poverty in the world and that needs to be celebrated and we need to at least ask where has it happened? What were the conditions that coincided with it? You know, what happened in China that suddenly a billion human beings were lifted from destitution to the middle and lower middle classes? They sort of think, yes, well, maybe you should ask. What exactly did happen? What actually changed in India in 1995 to suddenly go from stagnation and contraction to growth? What happened in Africa? Sub-Saharan Africa is now the highest growth region in the world. What changed? How come the only region that was getting poorer is now getting richer faster than any other region? You'd think they would ask that question. When I point that out, they say, yes, well, why? What did happen? And it's quite interesting how open I found people like the famous broadcaster you mentioned, <laughs> to consider that. With that, uh, Cecilia, thank you again. And I have a feeling that this might not be your last appearance here <laughs> on this and related topics. I, I, uh, I suspect we'll see you back. And what I'm going to do is uh, give you a little gift. And uh, it's a book called South Africa, The Solution. It's a leather-bound edition written by my wife, Frances, and me. It was the biggest selling book in South Africa on South African issues, I think, ever to this day, and uh, went into something like eight or nine prints. And it has a foreword by Winnie Mandela, and, her, and she's autographed it. So I think uh, that gives it some idea of the degree to which there can be crossover in ideas. And it also has on the back jacket uh, compliments by people like Hendrik Verwoerd Jr. and uh, <laughs> And uh, who's the chap who runs Urania? Um, so his son now runs it. Anyway, across the political spectrum, that's what we try to achieve and what I believe you try to achieve. And so I hope if you haven't come across the book, you might enjoy dipping into it because it does, I hope, transcend these simple notions of left and right and 
looks at the human condition as what's important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Very happy or sad proceedings, depending on how you experience them. And <laughs>